so I'll speak in English um, because I think as a part of the panel it will work better. Um, so this is the Media Lab building. Um, it was designed by Fumihiko Maki, and it's in not in a, so Cambridge where we live um, is not innovative probably in the same way that London and New York are, but it has its own version of being very innovative. And I think one of the keys to the ecosystem of Cambridge and then more closely around MIT is the relationship between the academics, the fact that we have Harvard and MIT within walking distance, and that everything, almost everything, you can find within walking distance. And it's a, it's a small kind of microcosm. So I think a lot about the school and the institution as well as how do we in, encourage innovation and create an in, in innovative um, city. Inside of the Media Lab, it looks kind of like this. And so when we were, um, when they were designing this with um, Maki-san, they were trying to create a space that encouraged collaboration. So this is a, a, a space and has three different labs. And as you can see, it's all about making things and building things. So it's, in some ways, it resembles a museum because people walk through the labs and see all kinds of things. But it's also very much a living, uh, living lab. But these buildings in the institution of MIT, even though I think is very innovative, I think there are some changes that we need to think about. So I often use this metaphor. I, I, I'm an internet guy, so I still remember the world before internet, BI, when life was simple. Things were predictable. There were a lot of rules that you could follow. Economists were mostly um, could predict things. And what happens after internet is the world becomes extremely complex, it becomes unpredictable, and it becomes hyperconnected. And my personal opinion is that there are some similarities in the world from before internet and after internet, but eventually there are fundamental changes that happen to just about everything um, in the world. And when we think about it, it, I think that this internet thing is an evolutionary step where we're going kind of into the next phase but when you think about evolution, you kind of think about this sort of designed orderly process, maybe like this um, artist image of us taking off. But I think it's actually much more like a natural system. I think that when you think about this massively complex thing that looks like chaos, if you don't really understand it, it actually looks a lot more like nature than it does like some sort of orderly engineered process. And I think what's really important as we start to think about science and technology, which is one of the key things that we work on at the lab, is how to redesign the way that we think about science and technology. So science and technology historically has been to try to make life more efficient, more um, controlled. It was often an attempt to control nature. So what you would do is you would control nature to try to get local gain, to try to make more money, to try have more energy. And the idea was kind of really feasting on nature at nature's expense for our benefit. It turns out we got really good at this and we were destroying nature. And so even a lot of art, some of the gar beautiful gardens that I see, even the Japanese bonsai as well as the European manicure gardens, it's really kind of a triumph over nature. Look what we made nature do. But I think that that attitude in science and technology will destroy us. And so one of the fundamental shifts that we, I think we're doing at the Media Lab and other places, Neri's work is a very uh, good example of this, is really trying to become part of nature, learning from nature, and designing into with nature rather than trying to um, design over nature. So that, that's, I think, a really important sort of design principle. The other thing that's happening is that these kids are now using the internet. So I still remember when there was no internet, but these kids don't remember that. And I think that there's a fundamentally different brain that's being created inside of these kids' heads. They have a different cognitive model. And so us, we are designing a world, cities, for kids whose minds we don't understand. And so I think we also have to create a process that allows us to be flexible enough so that when the kids get there, um, they feel comfortable as well. This is what the way that education works still. And even MOOCs, while they're great, um, still is kind of based on this model, that there's some important person that everybody focuses on and you receive information and knowledge. And the idea that you would study 
I mean, I, I often think about courses in schools as kind of like reading the encyclopedia from end to end before you get to do anything. You know, that in the world of the internet, you can get the information as you need it. You can search for things. You can ask people things. You're never going to be on the top of a mountain by yourself with a test and a number two pencil. You'll always have your network with you. So how do you redesign a world which is not about linear learning? So this is a sensor that we've designed at the lab that measures your galvanic skin response, which is basically the uh, conductivity of your skin. And it tells you roughly your neurological activity. So we had an MIT student wear it for a week, and this is what it looks like. So if you look here, um, this is when they're in the lab, there's a little bit of activity, not too much activity when they're watching TV. Sleep, it turns out, there is activity because you see dreams and things, and then relaxing. Studying, it's a lot of activity because you're using your brain. Sleep, again, class flat, class flat, class flat, <laughs> class flat. In fact, classes are flatter than when you're sleeping. So if this is some indication of how these young people enjoy the lectures or how much neural activity is occurring, because you kind of have to have neural activity to actually learn. That's probably a pretty decent guess. And so, so, so we have data to show that I think that we need to think about the educational system as well. The, the, the other thing I think that's really important when we think about innovation is innovation is about creativity. And in the post-industrial organized mass-produced world, you didn't really want a whole bunch of people being creative when they're making widgets or painting cars. But in an information world where machines are taking over most of the repetitive tasks and human beings are being forced to be innovative, you want more and more society to behave in a creative way. And our educational system is really rewarding people who do predictable things in an organized way and do give you the same answer no matter who you ask. But what you really want is you want creativity, which is that everyone gives you different answers and they all question and things like that. So, so I think that in a creative society, an innovative society, um, these two things are connected. And I think we forget that when we design education. Um, and so I think you have to think about the mind in, in a completely new way, because I think that we really have been focused on trying to make the mind behave more like a computer or behave more like a robot. When we have robots and computers now, we have to redesign the way we think about the mind. This is a wonderful sketch by um, Rich Gold, who, who was actually an interesting person because he had many hats. He was an artist, he was a scientist, he was a designer, he was an engineer. And this is an interesting matrix because and this ties to a lot of the other things. So, so designers tend to look at, so, so for instance, if you have a designer, they try to figure out what the audience wants and then produce it. So, so if, I, if I were a designer and you said, oh, can you change that green to match the color of my sofa so it fits my room better? A designer would love that feedback. Artists probably wouldn't. Um, artists tend to be looking at nature or looking at within for some sort of truth. It's very similar, by the way, to scientists. So when a scientist is going after a new subatomic particle, that scientist isn't thinking at that moment about exactly how this is going to change the way he lives his life. But, it is, but, but there is some sort of peering into the truth and, and, and this pursuit of beauty. And it's interesting because the designers and the engineers are kind of similar. Engineers try to get real world constraints and create things that have utility, things that have function. And so in a funny way, in, Designers and engineers tend to get along better than um, de designers and artists and scientists and engineers. Um, but I, for anybody who saw Neri's presentation, I think what's important is that actually one person can do all of these things. And I think the key is to be able to do all of them. So in, in, interdisciplinary is when you have four people and they're talking to each other. Antidisciplinary is what we call ourselves, is when you have one person doing all of them. Now, you can argue whether you can be an artist while you're being a designer or not. But the idea that you can do all of them is actually very important because I think science inspires engineering, art inspires design, and the designer is one way, at least, for art to impact a city or to impact the real world is through this translation between artist and designer and scientist and engineer. So this is just kind of an interesting thing. When I post this on the internet, there are a lot of people get upset because, it's, well, what about the, the uh, you know, what about history or what about, you know, so there's, this is the way I look at the world, though. Um, so, you know, this is, these are some principles of after internet that I like to talk about, um, and I won't go through all of them, but you know, this, this idea, notion of pull over push, this, is, this means that instead of stocking all this information and power centrally and pushing it out, 
which is the way you would do traditional command and control. It's you pull it from the network as you need it. You don't learn things, because you can learn just about anything on the internet when you want it now. And so you don't actually have to memorize everything beforehand. Um, uh, you, you can find a YouTube video for just a, to learn just about anything. And so, so the idea is actually it makes you a lot more flexible and agile if you're not carrying a lot of things. The, 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 the typical, and this, this is, I would love to talk more about museums too, because the problem is when you stock a bunch of stuff, you get very heavy. And if it's, whether it's lines of code or lots of employees, it makes it very difficult for you to change course. And now cities, it's tricky because cities are about stuff. And I think what's interesting is to think about what is the equivalent for cities for that. Compass over maps is, I, I, I like to think about having, it's important to have a general trajectory, but when you get there, the complexity of the world today makes it very, very difficult to know exactly what's gonna happen. And so I gave this example um, at, at the previous session, but I, I had a company that was trying to raise money and the investors spent more money deciding not to do it on the feasibility study than they did than on the investment. So when the cost of thinking about something or the cost of planning something actually exceeds the cost of trying, then that doesn't make sense anymore. And I think one of the key things with the internet, with software, and now with digital fabrication and other types of technology, the, 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 the cost of trying things has gotten so low that often it doesn't pay to make maps. Um, again, practice over theory is, is another one which I really like. This is, we, we do this at the labs. Some of my faculty don't like this because some of them are very theoretical, but, but the idea is that don't let the lack of theory stop you from trying something. And often when you try something, you will learn something that you wouldn't have been able to theorize. And, and so thinking about, you know, I'm on the board of two foundations, the Knight Foundation and the, the MacArthur Foundation. We actually give money to libraries and museums. And one of the things I push our program officers quite a bit on is don't come up with metrics. Don't measure book circulation in the library as one way measure of success because you're constraining them. Give them the money, let them do whatever they want to do, figure out if it's interesting, and then come up with the metrics. And I think that it's important to have theory, but I think it's important not to allow the lack of theory to prevent you from practice. Um, Disobedience over compliance is also, it's, it's, you don't win Nobel Prizes by doing what you're told. And I think it's interesting because all of the very, uh, you know, interesting people we have at the conference are very disobedient people who probably do, always questioning authority, but then they expect the people who work for them to be very obedient. And, and, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's kind of a, a problem. And then learning over education, because we're an educational institution, I would say, you know, education to me is what people do to you and learning is what you do to yourself. And we have a group called Lifelong Kindergarten, which is kindergarten is when everybody's playing and learning because they're passionate. And as you get into grade school, you stop being allowed to have so much fun and you, it, life gets organized, life like, gets less creative. There's a great um, book by um, uh, the, the Kelly brothers about creative confidence. And this kid who's seven years old, he pulls a piece of clay out of a bucket and starts making a horse, and another kid looks over the shoulder and says, what an ugly horse, and he throws the clay back into the bucket and never touches it again. And I think school is so much about destroying creative confidence, and we actually have to actively generate creative confidence, and I think that a lot of this has to do with the notion of education being really trying to organize people rather than um, promote creativity. So I'll, f I'll finish with a couple of images. This, these are images from minor the movie Minority Report. Um, one of our graduates, John Underkoffer, um, was one of the main um, advisors on the technology and the displays and things like this. It's kind of interesting because this movie, this movie was created um, over 10 years ago, and Steven Spielberg made them make the whole world so that he could go in there with, and point the camera anywhere and shoot the shot. So they had to design all the technology and the underlying thinking behind it. And this is supposed to be set in 2054. Well, half the stuff already works now. You know, and so I think another thing that's really important to think about as we think about the future, 20, I think one of our homework assignments was to think 20 years from now, um, is that it takes longer, sometimes it takes a little longer than you expect in the short term. But when you look in the long term, technology tends to come faster than we expected. And so I think that we really need to be thinking um, very aggressively in this kind of science fiction-y way about cities in the future. Thank you. <laughs>